love to just kick off with is if you could talk a little bit to us about what neurotheology is. I've always thought of you and heard of you as the pioneer of that whole field of neurotheology. And the, the term itself, I think, spikes a ton of interest in people. So I'd love if you could break sure. that down for us. Well, I, I think the, the, the simplest definition of neurotheology is that it's a field of scholarship that seeks to understand the, the relationship or the link between our brain and our religious and spiritual selves. Um, so that's, that's the basic definition then. But to take that a little bit further, which I think is important, is, is a couple of things. One is, is that um, neurotheology, for me, at least for me, for it to work as a term, uh, it needs to be understood as a full two-way street. And what I mean by that is that it's not neuroscience looking at religion only. Uh, it is not uh, uh, just you know, Buddhist and, and Hindu perspectives on consciousness telling us about uh, science, but it is science and the spiritual sides of ourselves kind of looking together at these things and, and looking at each other and helping us to ultimately understand who we are as human beings. So uh, to me, part of it is that we need to be kind of very, very open and very appreciative and respectful of both sides of what neurotheology is. Um, the other aspect is that when we talk about those two sides, the neuro side and the theology side, uh, it also has to be understood that those need to be kind of blown up in terms of being uh, being able to accommodate a lot of other aspects. So neuro typically refers to neuroscience or neuroimaging, but it can also include psychology, it can include anthropology, it can include uh, health and uh, you know, both psychological as well as physical health. So there's a lot of things that go into the neuro part of the neuro side of theology, uh, of neurotheology. And then the theology, you know, <clears throat> theology is a very specific discipline. It's taking a you know, the foundational texts and ideas of a given tradition and trying to, you know, understand them and break them down, and figure out what they mean and so forth. And we can certainly look at theology from a brain related perspective, uh, but it also, that also needs to be expanded. It needs to include the, you know, different experiences, uh, flow type of experiences, mystical experiences, spiritual experiences, practices like meditation and prayer. Um, it needs to include uh, you know, different aspects of human beliefs, uh, rituals, you know, so all these different things that go into what religious and spiritual phenomena ultimately are. And if we kind of use those two basic ideas, the two way street and a very broad perspective on it, I think as a term, you know, it, it works very well. I mean, you know, we, we toyed with other possibilities, psycho spirituality and bio theology and all that kind of stuff. But for, for lack of, you know, no real good reason, neurotheology just seems to be the one that has stuck. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, fir the first mention of the term actually goes back to a 19, I believe, 1961 uh, novel by Aldous Huxley called The Island. And, um, and he's talking about a futuristic society that does all these kind of, you know, newfangled things. And one of them is he refers to as neurotheology, but doesn't really define what it is. He just kind of mentions it. But, but mm -hmm. from there... Uh, as Stephen was saying, you know, over the last 25, 30 years, we've been able to really uh, delve into it in a much greater way than we ever have before, especially bringing in the neuroimaging. But, but there's a lot of different pieces to it. And, and obviously, I'm sure we'll cover a bunch of them today. Super. Uh, that's, that's uh, one thing I want to, uh, this is, you know, in a sense, there were, we've done a couple of partnerships with much more spiritually minded organizations, um, Mind Valley, for example. And, um, a lot of the ideas floating around in those organizations still make me as a person usually uncomfortable. But the reason I pursued these partnerships is the, exactly what you said, because both looking at yourself, looking at you know, the phenomenal work that Richie Davidson has done um, and Madison and, and other people, it is the collaboration from both sides together that right. really have, you know, I always, I, we would have, without that collaboration, without the, for just to use <clears throat> Richie Davidson, for example, I always think that without the Dalai Lama's input into that conversation, it would have taken us 25 years to bother looking at compassion-inducing meditation, right? It's just not a Western thing that people are going to be like, oh, yeah, we should study this first. But, right, the Dalai Lama was so insistent that this was at the center of it, and you had to start there. And we would have never started there. And, and as a result, we have a new understanding of how empathy works in the brain. We have a new understanding of how perspective-taking works. And we have a new understanding of kind of the social 
impact of meditation like we've never had before. And that's, that's amazing. That's totally out of the collaboration. It would have never happened had we produced, pursued these solitarily. So I just had to add that in because um, your emphasis on this has sort of you know, driven our research a little bit and how I, and, and our, some of our partnerships. Right. Well, and, and again, you know, part of what I think also makes it, uh, neurotheology exciting as a field is, is the need for input from so many different directions. And so, you know, we need the input from the neuroscientists. We need the input from the theologians. We need the input from, from the practitioners, the people who are doing these things. And, and I think the other thing which often gets kind of overlooked is that we need the information from, from everybody. You know, we, uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is, you know, if you're going to study uh, spirituality, I mean, you could, I could read the, the, the Hindu texts, I could read the Buddhist texts, I could study the life of Buddha. But another approach is to just ask people, you know, what do they experience when they, when they feel the things that they do? And I think that's really a testament to a lot of what the work that you guys have done. Uh, you know, be, because you're looking at the kind of experiences that lots of people can have. And so, you know, that it was really is fundamental to this. It was this conversation early on because I was taught, I was having conversations a lot when we, you and I were getting to know each other. I was also getting to know Laird Hamilton, the big wave surfer. Right. And now, 25 years later, Laird, I, I now know Laird is incredibly precise in his speech and very he's very he will name the thing exactly as it is but back then he would say things like i was out surfing and i felt one with the wave and i thought oh he's using this new age hippie not like i couldn't mm. wrap my head around the language and it was through you know conversations with you where i started to realize that he wasn't being metaphorical no. he was being literal and yeah. if i actually took him at his word and believed him Right? right? I could actually get to the biology. I had right. to start believing my interview subjects That's about right. their experiences <laughs> before, yes. right? And which is a really, as a science guy, and Ed, Ed, Ed is nodding with this, that's a hard step to take, right? I don't believe you understand your inner subjective experience. I'm a professional. <laughs> I've had now, training. You are 100% right. I mean, I, you know, I've listened to so many people give me descriptions, which, you know, uh, from a purely scientific perspective are very challenging. But, but I, I, you know, I, this, is, this is oftentimes people ask me towards the end of the interview, uh, what have you learned from all this? So we'll start with that. But, you know, what I've learned is, is just what you just mentioned, which is that, you know, a, a very healthy respect and compassion and understanding for each person's individual experiences of these things, that we have to take them very seriously. We have to do our best to understand them and what they mean and how they affect the person. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can you know, even get the, the, the narrative descriptions, uh, as you were talking about with, like, with Laird or something like that, you know, exactly what they're saying and how they're saying it, um, that's incredibly powerful stuff for helping us to understand what these experiences are like, and then ultimately tying it back into what's going on in the brain itself. Yeah, I think oftentimes an aversion that folks who are in more of the spiritual communities can have to the science guys, Stephen, is that they think that you both or folks like you are attempting to reduce the experience down to something right. that's happening in the brain, but you're just saying that, you know, there is the experience and there is this thing in the brain. It's not that the experience is not its own thing. Um, could you talk I, a little bit I, how you, about how you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, and that goes back a little bit to what I was saying about the two-way street. I mean, it is, we really, while there are times where it can sound reductionistic because we're, okay, you know, this is what's going on in the amygdala, and this is what's mm -hmm. happening in the frontal lobes or something like that. Um, we do have to be very cautious about exactly, you know, where the causal arrow is with regard to these experiences, what are the different aspects of them. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it really is an opportunity to understand all the facets of these experiences. And even if somebody has a mystical experience where they, you know, perceive the universe in a completely different way and they have a sense that there's a, a universal consciousness or there's a God, um, you know, I, I, my, I can't prove that there is or isn't a God based on mm -hmm. what I'm doing, but I can tell you what's going on in the brain of the person who has that experience. And if somebody feels connected to God, if somebody feels connected to universal consciousness, what are the changes that are going on in the brain? It's, it doesn't eliminate the other part of the conversation. Yeah. It doesn't eliminate that spiritual side, that experiential side, but it adds something that we've never had an opportunity to add before. 
And it also then enriches the discussion about, well, so what exactly is that experience? I mean, because there is a little bit of, well, you know, is it just a brain phenomenon? I mean, these are, these are valid questions that need to be carefully considered. But as we go through it, if we're careful, we don't just jump to these kind of answers. Oh, you know, well, it's just that or it's just this, that we realize that there really are very complex, uh, multidimensional uh, aspects to these experiences. Yeah. Yeah, so, I also yeah. read, I, you also, one of the things when you follow, you take people as, and their experiences at their word, you find such subtle nuance. I'll give you a really, I'll give you a weird example, but it's one I think of very often. There's a, there are, there's a spectrum of trance experiences. The, okay, the biggest mystery in flow, in my opinion, is the characteristic known as the sense of control. Right, a feeling of I can control things that are beyond my normal control. Right, it's that you know, it's it's that sense of mass of, of incredible mastery. In the trance literature, there's two sides to that coin. There are trances where you're in control of your actions, and then there's a whole other side: possession states, speaking right. in tongues, stuff that Newberg has looked very much at. That for a really long time people dismissed and said, oh, this, this, this is so crazy. There's no, uh, but if you look at it from a flow question, well, in one experience, you have total control and mastery over your situation. I'm in flow, whatever challenge you put in front of me, I got it, right? Versus I'm in a trance state, I'm in a possession state where something else feels like it's controlling me. And so if you take those experiences seriously as Dr. Newber, first of all, it teaches you something about how does the brain create this sense of control that we all feel? Um, mm. And when we give it up for certain experiences, is there something really sacred in those experiences, right? You hear, watch for spiritual lit language attached to experiences where we lose control. I've been taken over than when we're in total control. If you mm -hmm. take that seriously, then you'd have to say, well, interesting, there's some neurobiology there that we don't quite understand. And it seems somewhat related to the reward system, right? People like this better. Why is that? What can that teach us about motivation in general? Like all those questions are worth, you know, addressing from a science side. You can't get there unless you're like really literally going deep with people into experiences that you have to take their experience, at least what I've learned from Dr. Neuberg, is you have to take it very, very literally um, until proven differently. It's like in court, right? You're, 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 you're truthful until proven different. Right. 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 Well, it's difficult to argue with an experience. You know, someone just, someone is having the experience. It's, it's tough to say, you know, no, you're not. <laughs> right. Well, so. and also it raises some interesting questions about, you know, can you, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great point Steve was making about, um, you know, there, we've always talked in our research about this continuum of these, of these experiences all, along a lot of different lines. And, um, and, and when you look at the richness and diversity of these experiences, it does become essential to know what people are really, you know, what they're really feeling. Um, and then it raises some fascinating issues. You know, I mean, uh, I, maybe another, you know, similar tangential way of, of, of the way I talk about it is you know when we look at, at spiritual experiences some people they say will say i felt an energy some people feel, felt a force some people feel love some people feel god um are those the same experience described differently because of the the ways in which their belief systems kind of started them out um or are they fundamentally different experiences is the experience of, of being in god's presence completely different than an experience, you know, an incredible, you know, enraptured sense of love, for example. Uh, and, and this is also part of where, you know, it's not just the words, but then it ties back to what's going on in the brain. You know, if we do a brain scan and we found, find that, that people experiencing God have a different kind of pattern than people who are experiencing love, um, that may tell us something as well, that, you know, there really is something fundamentally different biologically. Or on the other hand, if the, the patterns look very similar, then, then maybe this, the experiences are far more similar. And now this is a way in which people kind of start to talk about them in different kinds of contexts because of their underlying belief systems that they're taking into it with them. 